America again turned to space with a curiosity and enthusiasm not seen in years. The rocket, larger this time and far more complex, five onboard computers this time, none last time, and today the crew compartment carried seven people from three nations instead of one lone American. But just like the Mercury flight of Friendship 7 in 1962, today's launch of the Space Shuttle Discovery carried one John Herschel Glenn, today known as Payload Specialist Number 2, back into orbit. Well, standing by now at the Kennedy Space Center is CNN's Miles O'Brien, who covered today's launch. Miles? Lou, you could add one more comparison to that list. Uh, 36 years ago, there were 11 separate delays over three months. This time around, a mere 19 minutes with just a few minor problems to report. We'll get into that in just a few moments. At about three hours and 10 minutes into the mission, John Glenn, with Discovery orbiting over Hawaii, made his first radio call from orbit in 36 years. Hello, Houston. This is TS2. I mean, let me get sprung out of the mid-deck for a little while. We're just going by Hawaii, and that is absolutely gorgeous. Hey, Roger that. Glad you're enjoying the show. Boy, enjoying the show is right. This is beautiful. The best part is that uh, do a trite old statement, zero G, and I feel fine. Zero G and I'll be, I feel fine, an echo of 36 years ago on that mission. Discovery lifted off and rocketed into a flawlessly clear blue sky about 19 minutes after the launch window opened up 2 p.m. Eastern time. One slight delay came from a faulty sensor reading, another when a private plane strayed into the no-fly zone around the Kennedy Space Center. Among the 7,000 invited VIPs and 3,700 media types here at the Cape, President and Mrs. Clinton, who watched with the aid of binoculars. Now, there is the minor problem that we told you about at the top. The drag chute door at the back of the shuttle, right above the middle engine, as you see here in isolation, fell off just as Discovery lifted off the pad. The ground controllers here in Florida say it should not adversely impact the mission. The purpose of the drag chute is to assist us in slowing the vehicle and in crosswind landing capability. Uh, we flew the first 50 missions of the space shuttle program, or I should say the first mission where we flew a drag chute was STS-50, and we obviously can successfully land the space shuttle without the drag chute. It is possible to land a shuttle without a drag chute. In fact, the first 50 shuttle missions flew without them entirely, so if, in fact, that drag chute doesn't deploy, NASA says it's no problem. It just means the shuttle might roll one or 2,000 extra feet down the shuttle landing facility runway or Edwards Air Force Base, as the case may be, depending on where the shuttle finally lands. Right now, the shuttle is in its third orbit over the Indian Ocean, approaching Australia, and in a little less than an hour, John Glenn will double his log time in space. Lou? Miles, thank you. Miles O'Brien reporting from Cape Canaveral, where he and uh, Walter Cronkite did a splendid job uh, covering the launch today of Space Shuttle Discovery. Today's shuttle flight created a moment that seemed to go back to another time. People gathered together around television sets and schools and offices in public spaces such as Times Square in New York City. People stopped and they looked. And in downtown Chicago this afternoon, it was very much the same story. At the site itself, Cape Canaveral, one of the largest crowds ever assembled to watch a space launch. Mark Potter reports from Titusville. ...and to arrive in the pre-dawn hours, hoping to get the best seats for liftoff later in the afternoon. One benefit of arriving so early is that the sunrise was as spectacular as the weather for launch that followed. As the morning unfolded, several hundred thousand people from around the country and the world crowded the beaches, roads, causeways, even the fishing piers, to get the best glimpse of history in the making. Everyone had their reasons for being here, and for most, it was to see John Glenn return to space. John is getting everybody all excited again about going up to space, and that's what NASA's whole program needed. Lillian Edwards came all the way from Rockford, Illinois, and arrived at a park in Titusville at 6 a.m. to get a front row seat. She said the country has found a much-needed hero in John Glenn. You know, the country is so sick of hearing about Monica. And now we have, we can raise our head to the skies. Among the crowd was a man with an interesting name. 
My name is John Glenn. You're kidding. No, I'm not. He wasn't kidding. It said so on his credit cards and driver's license. As the time for launch approached, the excitement built. Finally, the delays passed, and the count toward launch wound down. As Discovery reached for the sky, the crowds erupted. You know, I've been sitting here all day wondering why I got up at 5 in the morning to be here, and it just all paid off. I was, I was very tense. <laughs> I was very tense. I just... I just wanted it to go smoothly. I just wanted it to sail away, and it did. When it takes off, it brings tears to your eyes. And now tell me why. I guess it just makes you proud to be an American. That's the way many felt here. Mark Potter, CNN, Titusville, Florida. Today's cheering crowds took little notice of Glenn's accomplished crewmates or even the commander of the shuttle. His name is a complete mystery to most. The Moneyline Briefing Book shows that his name is Curtis Brown, Jr. He is an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel who has logged 977 hours in space during more than a decade as an astronaut. Pilot Stephen Lindsay, also an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, he holds a master's degree in aeronautical engineering and is making his second space flight. And Scott uh, Parazinski, an emergency medical specialist who graduated with honors from Stanford University Medical School in 1989. He trained as backup crewman for the Russian space station Mir, but was scrubbed. He is too tall. And Stephen Robinson is also a Stanford grad with a doctorate in mechanical engineering. He's in charge of shuttle research. And Pedro Duque, uh, who is nicknamed Juan Glenn by his colleagues, is the first Spaniard in space. At 35, this aeronautical engineer is the youngest person on board. And Chiaki Muki is a heart surgeon with a PhD in physiology. The first Japanese woman in space, she sits beside Glenn at takeoff and landing. 